Our guest in this segment is from the Cardinal Institute, Dr. Jesse Troyan. We've had uh, Dr. Jesse on, uh, I guess, about two, two three weeks ago, yeah. in fact, about a different uh, topic matter. This has to do with a survey of West Virginians that was conducted in uh, cooperation with the Cardinal Institute. Dr. Jesse, good morning. How are you today? Good morning. I'm trying to thaw out still from the, the chilly drive in. Enough of that, huh? I, I am ready for the warmth. I am ready to feel my fingers when I walk outside the door. If you if just hang on till Friday, I think it's supposed to be like 60, 63 degrees on Friday. That, well, that sounds absolutely perfect. Like, let's get our blow-up pools out and let's go have ourselves a little bit of some pre-summer. You'll have to float it downstream once that warm temperature hits all this snow. I was going to say, plus the rain. And, yeah. uh, so we may very well have flooding down in the oh, yeah. Washington, D.C. area. I got a text from Steve Boykin earlier this morning. They just got back. You know, Steve's a scuba diver. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were uh, around the islands, I guess, where it was 88 degrees. He flew back to Martinsburg where it was 8 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> from 88 to 8. <laughs> Woo. Where did he lose those 80 degrees at? <laughs> that's, a, that's a quick drop right there. I'm not sure how you deal with that. <laughs> Excuse me, Jesse. Let's talk about the poll that you folks conducted. If you could tell me first and foremost, how long was this poll planned and what was the inspiration for it? Uh, so we started discussing the, the plans to do this polling as part of an entire comprehensive listening research plan about – six months ago, six, seven months ago over the summer, um, because as we were getting deeper into the the benefit cliffs research that you guys had me on to discuss a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. we realized that, that our team didn't really have a lot of this firsthand experience, and we wanted to make sure that we were checking our priors, checking our biases, and making sure that the, the solutions that we were proposing and the ideas that we were talking about, like, is this something that the rest of West Virginia felt like needed to have the same focus on it that we were that we were gearing up to give it? Let's talk about some of the questions asked and some of the results. This was a poll of 765 registered voters conducted for you by, is it Targo's Market Research? Jessica? Correct. Okay. That is correct. And uh, there were a lot of different types of questions that were asked and answered, some of which had to do with satisfaction with the direction of the state versus satisfaction of the direction of the country. And then it had to deal with some of the benefit cliffs and uh, how to address the low worker participation rate in the state of West Virginia. So let's start first with uh, some of your questions regarding the attitude toward the direction of the state and the direction of the country there, Jesse. What did you folks find out? So what we found is with respect to the direction of the country, only about 19% of our respondents were saying they were very or somewhat satisfied with the direction of the U.S. And that contrasts with 47% satisfaction when asked just specifically about the state. So I think that what that is reflecting here is an acknowledgement of the, the policies that have been passed in recent years, whether we're talking about the tax reforms that were passed last spring, um, the largest personal income tax cut in the state's history, and I think the first significant tax reform in that, uh, in that realm, honestly, in my entire lifetime, um, or school choice policies and so on and so forth. And so I think that says that's a signal that what policymakers have been focusing on and putting their attention toward in recent years, that's showing up and people are optimistic about where things are going in the state. Um, but we're acknowledging there's, there's a long shadow of the past, and West Virginia does face um, some reputational deficits. I would call it, and and we're fighting against strong headway or headwinds, excuse me, um, coming from like nationally led policy. You know, there's not a lot that state lawmakers can do necessarily about inflation, um, for example. There was uh, the one question, which is the one that you hear every presidential cycle, every four years, which is, are you better off now than you were four years ago? 
What did you find in your survey of West Virginians when you asked that question? Uh, so compared to a year ago statewide, people are only 15 percent are saying that they are a lot or somewhat better off compared to a year ago. 57 percent are saying that they are a lot or somewhat worse off compared to a year ago. Um, and briefly, I'm, I'm going to return to the inflation point, but I think that says, you know, that's those are those federal headwinds that we're facing kind of on the state policy level. Jesse, picking up on that, uh, there's an old saying that uh, I don't like Congress except my own. I like my own congressman, which which basically says that it's closest you are to something, the more favorable you are, uh, you more favorable your reception to it. Uh, would that somewhat account for the fact that 19 percent of the uh, view the country's going in the right direction as opposed to going in the wrong direction? as opposed to 47% in West Virginia? I think so. I think that you could draw that same parallel. Uh, in policy circles, we love to call that the Congress problem. Um, but like you said, you know, Congress is a unit not too happy with, but we're happy with our own particular Congress people. Um, and I think that there's also a sense of West Virginians feel like they have more of a voice and are actually heard um, when it when it pertains to policies and issues um, at the state level. Yeah, that kind of, that reinforces what I was driving at my question. That you can you cannot take this just on face value. There's always there's other uh, uh, pressure points and circumstances, and one of which being that you tend to look with more disdain toward the national level than what you do the local level. Oh, I would agree with that, and I think it's a level of feeling like that, feeling like you can have some sort of influence and control over the direction of things, for sure. Forty-seven percent had responded that they were satisfied or totally satisfied with the direction that the state was headed in. However, fifty percent felt like they did not have a good economic opportunity personally in the state of West Virginia. I think those numbers are interesting. Yeah, those those invite a really interesting question for policy folks like us here at the Cardinal Institute and for our law for our lawmakers who are all gathered here in Charleston um, through you know mid March. That it's we acknowledge the progress that's been made, but I think that that reinforces the fact that getting back to the fundamentals, what are you know, good policy, what allows people to access good jobs, what is encouraging businesses to locate here, what is encouraging small businesses to pop up and for people to pursue their own entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial ventures. Um, so I think that that gives, that gives our lawmakers a lot to chew on and and it reinforces kind of focusing on the fundamentals of what what good policy is so that, you know, we can come up from this or so that we can reduce this 50 percent of people who rate the economic opportunities in West Virginia as poor or very poor. We've got to really focus on those fundamentals so that more than 13 percent of folks are saying that they've got, you know, excellent or very good opportunities. 60% said it was difficult for someone in my community to find a job that pays a living wage. Mm -hmm. 60%. Once again, this is fundamentals. It's, you know, it's a small business environment. It's an overall good policy environment that encourages people to, you know, encourages people to build work to find work and to, you know, create these better opportunities that, you know, revitalize and create this more vibrancy, this, this greater vibrancy kind of in our communities um, above and beyond, you know, to, to use a little bit of a cliche here, you know, we need more than say a convenience store and a dollar general. We want to have these lively places that we're proud to be 
that we're proud to have as part of our community. Doctor, do you have a sense that the uh, the legislators are taking serious your research? I believe so. I've had some conversations uh, with with some of our lawmakers uh, since session has kicked off 12 days ago, and they're interested in the research and I think encouraged by the fact that people are drawing attention to these issues, um, and especially with as it relates to this polling that that the entirety of West Virginia is acknowledging that, hey, there are some challenges here. Hey, a lot of these safety net programs are not really living up to what we think they should be. Um, and it's and it's encouraging them to take the time and delve into these bigger, deeper problems that are going to take a sustained level of focus dedication and in some senses spending of political capital um, to try and and solve these problems and forge a path for a new way of doing things in West Virginia to to help out those of us who are facing some of the biggest challenges. So um, Bill had uh, actually asked the same question I was thinking about is whether our legislators are are listening um, when saying 60 percent 60% 60% are not um, having a job that's meeting the needs from wages. Do you, since the session is in, um, do you think our legislators are going to take this information that you have from this survey and use it to form new budgets and incentives for businesses? You know, we have in the Eastern Panhandle, we have a lot of businesses that want to come here in Berkeley County, but it provides jobs to a small percentage of the people that live within Berkeley County. The rest are kind of looking at it's creating um, the businesses are coming. It's creating more hardship. Our infrastructure can't handle what we have now. But a large portion of our population, as you see on there, do not have a job that supports their livelihood or even a uh, small part of their livelihood. Really quickly, can you rephrase back to the initial question? Yeah, do, yeah. Do you do you feel that our legislators are going to be looking at this survey as they look towards creating a budget and benefits for uh, for the new year? The conversations that I have had indicate that that lawmakers are taking seriously these sentiments um, and are are continuing to focus on the kinds of policies that make West Virginia a better place to live, work and raise a family and for for plenty of folks who live on the other side of the state's borders to make West Virginia a more attractive choice. I do think that, that there is sustained and genuine focus towards those ends. Jesse, let's talk about uh, some of the questions that pertain to workforce participation rate in the state. Uh, tell us how you set up some of the questions and what kind of information you found. All right. so. As, as most listeners are going to be familiar with, West Virginia has the lowest or second lowest. We're often jockeying back and forth with Mississippi for which state has the lowest labor force participation rate. And there are a lot of theories for that. And so we wanted to take it directly to the people and ask them what they thought the causes of this were. Um, kind of. I wouldn't say necessarily shockingly, but it is still disappointing all the same that 81% of, of our survey respondents were saying that issues with drugs or substance abuse um, was one of the major causes. Um, reflecting back to the questions you gentlemen were just asking, 75% of folks were saying it's lack of good paying jobs. So if you're going to work really hard and still you're not making enough to make ends meet, that's going to discourage individuals. Um, same thing with high child care costs or family responsibility. We've got 73% saying that that is a huge factor. Um, and I can go on. There's 60% there's just discouraged workers that have given up, 58% talking about generous welfare or unemployment benefits. Um, and then other issues like aging population. Statistically, we do have an older state. Um, lack of access to education and training, criminal records, and health and disability issues. And all of these 
um, health and disability issues was the lowest, and even that was 53% of respondents saying that that was a major or moderate role, up to 81% believing that issues with drugs or substance abuse Jesse, looking were part at, of it. Looking at your priorities for 2024, I see health care access for all. Oh, before you move on to that, Bill, I want to okay. stay on this question I'm for sorry, just a second. Me, sorry, okay. sorry. Because uh, it, it's a technical question. When we measure unemployment rates, we're measuring only those people who are actively seeking work. When we, mm-hmm. member, when we measure workforce participation rate, are we also measuring only those who are actively seeking work, or does it take into account a broader spectrum of people in the state? Labor force participation rate is going to take into account a broader subset. So it is going to include those people who have given up and who are not in the job market, that they're not applying for work, they're not recently out of work for whatever the reason may be. So labor force participation rate is a more comprehensive. But it it wouldn't include retirees and children, for instance, correct? Correct. So if it's an the aging population, then shouldn't be an actual factor in a low workforce participation rate, despite the fact that that was something that was cited, right? But that, I think it can kind of cut both ways. Um, so that we're that the aging population that I think, especially in the last few years, the way that COVID really turned things upside down for a lot of people, that I think it influenced some decisions for individuals to, you know, enter into retirement early um, or to to just kind of get out of the workforce um, in, in a different sort of time period than what they were initially planning on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, going back to the health care, uh, the 2024 policy priorities, health care access for all. Then you say the Institute aspires to create a future in West Virginia uh, where people can access health care. But the effort should focus on individuals over government, which implies to me it's not an endorsement of Obamacare. But, but how, when you focus on individuals, what does that mean? How, so you, how, do, you, how the, do you implement it with focus on individuals? Okay, so the way that we have, have taken this approach on is with a focus on, we've been heavily focused on what's called certificate of need in West Virginia. And the, in a nutshell, that is uh, healthcare providers in a number of different sort of specialties um, that they have to get permission from the healthcare authority in West Virginia to expand or add to or, um, you know, expand their offerings to people, whether it's individual practice sites or even just the, the level of services that they provide. Um, and so what we think is that the, these practitioners, these healthcare providers, they know the situation on the ground. And if they are trying to open up some sort of a new practice, trying to offer a new specialty, a new service, um, they, they understand that there's clearly a need there. So why does there have to be this step that they have to go and get permission from a bureaucratic authority um, to, to go forth and expand their offerings and bring services to a greater number of people? Um, And in the same way, being able to do that, that's going to open up access and availability to West Virginians throughout the state if their local practitioners are able to nimbly respond to kind of changing conditions. There are probably fewer subjects that have been discussed on this program in the last two years on this station than certificate of need. And so the listening audience are well-versed upon, I think, the pros and cons. Would you advocate a carve-out and certificate of need for such things as hospice? We think that overall that all, all of certificate of need, that we think that it's antithetical to you know a free market economy it is it is government getting in the way and we think that it should be peeled back on 
on all of the things that it applies to. There's another uh, one example that we've used up here a great deal, and that's with uh, uh, trash pickup, trash mm-hmm. management. And uh, we before we had certificate of need, there were large segments of the county that was not uh, uh, trash pickup was not available. Uh, with certificate of need, it has now been picked up universally through the county. But at least a couple of companies say we should get rid of it, knowing full well that there be areas of the county that would not be picked up. Uh, How do you address something like that under the covers typical need? So to me, I don't think it it makes a substantive difference whether we're talking about health care or any other sort of service if it's trash pickup. Um, And I think if I'm remembering correctly, back in like 2016, the same thing applied with moving companies. Um, and that was that was ultimately adjudicated by the legislature. Um, but at the end of the day, the people in these given professions know the circumstances on the ground, and if they see a market opportunity to go in and provide services, that we shouldn't have this, like I said, this bureaucratic institution in the way that has to kind of sign off on it where, you know, people who are in the industry and themselves are seeing a need. Dr. Jesse Tryon, our guest from the Cardinal Institute, a poll of 765 uh, West Virginians taken recently about a variety of issues, including education. And before I let you go, I want to ask you this one about the K-12 education system in West Virginia poll. The question was, Please select how much you agree or disagree with the following statements. West Virginia's K-12 education system prepares people for a successful life and career. 46% totally agreed, either strongly or agree. That was the total between those who agreed or strongly agreed. 43% either disagreed or strongly disagreed. That implies to me that the state is divided down the middle, at least according to this poll, which has a 3.47% margin for error that uh, half the state agrees that you can get a good education in the state of West Virginia, and the other half disagrees. Yeah, um, I, I think that that is indicative of a lot of the kind of public policy fights that we've had in the last few years, um, especially around school choice. Um, the West Virginia has not necessarily lived up to what we expect of it in the education system. Um, but with some of the changes that have been made where we are creating more opportunities for students to find an education that best fits them um, and best puts them on a path for lifelong success. Um, So I think that there's, again, it's an acknowledgement of what's been done, but I'll say that there's still a lot of work left to be done. And uh, Jesse, what was the political makeup of the 765 uh, people who were polled? Do we know? Uh, yes, hold on. Let me let me find that here really quickly. Um, but overwhelmingly, what this matched up with it matched with the presidential uh, voting. Um, and I can't find the exact slide, but it basically matched up. Okay, oh, that's not it. Um, so with political affiliation and ideology, um, I'll put it to to your audiences this way. We've got 44% identifying as a Republican, 30% identifying as Democrat, 24% independent, and 2% something else. And if we're just tracking that on a conservative to liberal spectrum, we've got 40% identifying conservative, 33% moderate. 22% liberal and 6% not sure, um, which I think is pretty reflective of the attitudes of West Virginia. We might be a pretty deep red state um, overall, um, at least in terms of the way things look in the state house. But in the day to day life, West Virginia remains a pretty moderate state. Interesting. Jesse, where can people go to find this survey online and take a look at it in more detail? Yes, the website that everyone should go and check out, it's WV, is in West Virginia, WVDignity.com. What was the second word? 
Dignity. Dignity. Gotcha. W- yes, wvdignity.com. Jesse, thank you very much. Appreciate right. your time this morning. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great day. Dr. Jesse Troyan at uh, 933.